Hello everyone, it's Mark. Just a heads up, this podcast was recorded at PAX Unplugged in a room that we was fairly quiet but still had a fair amount of background noise, so I would recommend listening to this one with headphones if you can. I haven't tried it out like in a car, but from what I could tell, it might be a bit distracting at some parts, especially the very beginning and the very end, but I think it's a very interesting podcast, so I hope you still listen. Just wanted to give a heads up. Thanks. Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast. As always, my name is Mark. Here with me today is Matt. Hello. And our special guest today, designer of board games and here talking about non-zero sum games as a positive for society. That's going to be our main topic today. Ken Franklin. Hello. I'm very blessed to be here. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. I was super excited when you mentioned this topic. I, I love analyzing zero-sum interactions, non-zero-sum interactions, and everything in between, and I think games are a great, great way to do that. But let's start with a bit about you. How did you get into board gaming? Well, when I was five, my parents gave me a 52-game chest, which was a whole bunch of components and 52 little piddly games. But it was cheap, and it was at the dime store. Mm -hmm. And I not only loved it, but I loved making games out of new games out of components. And that started a hobby that has lasted me until 59 years later when I'm here. I played and collected and designed games all through school. When I went to college, game designer was not something that they had aptitude tests for, so I didn't think of it as a <laughs> career choice. And so I became a, an Army family physician, I was in the Army for 25 years, but I published a, a game in college. Uh, look, self-published uh, just locally in the town there. I made about $1,000 doing that. While I was in the military, I published some shareware games for the Apple II computer and the oh, Apple wow. II GS computer. Nice. Then uh, when I got out of the military in 2002, I uh, retired to a place called Vicksburg, Michigan, just south of Kalamazoo, and stayed in the hobby of collecting games. And in 2011, my son Matthew was an artist Sally, and I got, came with him, and I was my mind was blown. I happened to have brought a prototype game then, and I pitched it to Calliope Games, and they signed it, and the, my career took off from there. Very so, nice. So which game was that? That was the Mansky Caper, the Mansky which was Caper. published uh, two years ago. Fantastic. Yeah. And so what kind of games uh, were you, I mean, designing back in the day? Like, back, You name it. Anything? Uh, I went everything. You know, I had a subscription to strategy and tactics back, back in the 70s, so... So heavy games, uh, roll and moves, uh, push your luck, just whatever. Puzzle games, I'm a very avid puzzler. Uh, I like the variety. That's great. Talk about the Manxie Caper. So okay. well, the Manxie, how does that one work? The Manxie Caper is the first, again, the, my first opportunity, but it's pretty much set the pattern for the type of games I love to design. Mm -hmm. And it is a pressure luck game set in 1925. Um, Al Mansky is the richest mobster in town. And he doesn't treat anybody well. Nobody likes him. And he's out of town on vacation. So you and your fellow players, it plays two to six, This see this as your chance for revenge. So you're going to go in together in your getaway car, and you're going to ransack the place. But even though when you go into a room together, if one of you finds something, you have to share it, only the person with the most loot is the winner at the end of the game, because they're the new head of the family. So you're sort of working together. Mm-hmm. The first thing you find out is that Al's security system is based entirely on TNT. So <laughs> if you're going to keep anything, you have to take a turn to go out to the getaway car and stash what you found. But while you're at the getaway car, nobody has to share with you. So timing that is important. The other thing, though, is that every player has their own special ability. But it's not classy to use your ability to help yourself, so you're not allowed to. Fortunately, you've known each other long enough that you all owe each other favors. So if I call in a favor to you... You must use your ability to help me. But now you have two favors, and I have none. So I'm going to be advertising my services to everybody so that I can get those favors back. Because while you have a favor, you have everybody's power. I mean, if no favors, you have not, you've got no power. Mm -hmm. And that's the, that's the thing that makes the Vansky Caper unique. Yeah, and, and, and so it's, it's a matter of kind of pushing players toward that semi-cooperation and then also, like you said, the push your luck in terms of when you want to stash. Right. One of the ta one of the time uh, taglines is working together to help yourself and not get blown up. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's the idea of realizing that 
going in alone has very low likelihood of winning. But knowing when to work with others improves your strategy. And that is the core of a non-zero-sum game. Let me find a, a, a thing to do on my turn that helps you and me, and hopefully me a little more than you. Right, right. So let's let's go into that topic then of non-zero-sum. So a zero-sum situation is one in which kind of the gain, I guess, is locked in, right? Yeah. If, if, I, if I do something that helps me, it's necessarily at the expense of some of That's someone correct. else. And then in, in original game theory, in this non-zero-sum game, there would be an interaction between you and me. And at the end of that interaction, there would be a shift in resources. Mm -hmm. You would either lose X and I would gain X, or I would lose X and you would gain X. There is never an opportunity where both could gain or both could lose. Mm -hmm. It's always one wins at the expense of the other. Virtually all war games, combat games, are zero-sum game. I would beat you until there is lamentation of your women. You know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. okay? yeah, yeah. I don't enjoy those kinds of games uh, because I enjoy, I, you know, my slogan, my personal motto is I play to grin, I don't play to win. I don't enjoy the idea where one person has to be defeated or demolished. Right. I want it to be a positive experience for both of us. I want us to both enjoy it. Now, sometimes the process of play is fun, even if I lose. And in that case, I'll still play Zombicide or, you know, something like that, a campaign game. Because the experience is the fun rather than whether I have victory. But uh, I, I think it's more challenging and more elegant to point out that there's a way that we can all gain something out of it, even if there is a winner. Right. And that, that kind of drives, I mean, that's kind of the Euro game perspective, right? Is that uh, in a Euro game, you're typically, everyone's building, right? And someone right. just does it better or someone gets to the end point first. Although, you know, many Euro games, there's a take that component. Um, sure. Catan. Right, right. The robber baron. The robber baron, man, will mess with you. Uh, Concordia is a perfect example of a non-zero sum game. Mm -hmm. Any action that you take provides a profit for practically everybody around the game. But you get more. Reach for the stars, the same thing. You select an item. Everybody gets to do that action that turn. But the person who selected that action gets a little extra out of it. So so in that way, you, you're, you're encouraging people to work together so that both of you get to do the things you want. In the Mansky caper, that seems very deliberate in terms mm -hmm. of really pushing people to do things together. Although... At the point at which you're incentivizing that, right, the act of working together so that other people gains is the self-interested act. Is that deliberate on your part? Well, yeah, there has to be a co competition of some sort. Right. It's not a cooperative game. I, I thoroughly enjoy cooperative games. I've designed some cooperative games. But um, in this particular case, it's a, yeah, it's a matter of, yeah, you can call it manipulation, but there's very little behind, below the scenes, you know. I'm making you an offer you can't refuse. You're making me an offer I can't refuse. We're, we're, we're both looking for those opportunities of mutual self-interest that end up adding to our final score. And where I'm coming from that is, again, as a physician, I'm a fa as a family physician, mm -hmm. recognize that there are health and life benefits to not just limiting the unit of the universe as a person. Okay? We start with... We start with a quark to a meson to an atom to a molecule on up through organs and tissues and person. And then we have this artificial delineation, and then we go to couples and families and communities and you know cities and towns and states and on up through universe. Mm -hmm. It is only our own brain that says that's where the delineation is. When you're around the game table, you're a community, and that is an opportunity for everybody to gain health by gaining positive relationships. And so if I can have a game that fosters that, I'm contributing to the health of the world. And that's where I, that's, what's, that's what turns me on. There's some element of, of a game, um, uh, as you're describing, where there is one winner. So uh, I'm interested more to, to hear you talk about kind of the end of the game, where it is like, the, you know, the, this person has won. Right. So, so there's both that moment where someone wins, but then also... Some games feel so brutal where you do feel like maybe you even are getting a benefit from what else yeah. someone else has done, well, but, but you feel bad. And in the Mansky Caper, it's designed to have lots of storytelling moments. Yeah. When you finish the game, you know, those are the first ones. Oh, yeah, but you remember when you were doing this and this happened? And there's those, ah, yeah. what? You've been in a game room where or a game night store where 
you hear one of the tables across this hall and everybody going, oh! Yeah. <laughs> That's the kinds of moments you want because those are shared moments of joy and fun. Right. Yeah. And, and, and hearing you talk about, you know, the zero-sum interaction on different, or the non-zero-sum interactions on different scales also, I'm, or just the idea of it, right? I have a background a bit in economics, and that's like the foundation of economics is the idea that in a trade, it's not zero-sum. The big thing that Adam Smith brought to economics is understanding that, that even though both parties are being self-interested at the time, at the point of trade, they both think they're gaining. That's right, because they're they're... Their value system, right? their currency system, is different. Yeah. And something that benefits my currency system can also benefit your currency system. Yeah. And for me, a lot of people, I think, still see that as, like, a great problem, right? So, oh, but but they're both being self-interested. But to me, it's like, no, I mean, we can't get away from self-interest. Like, it's going to happen. The fact that in the system of self-interest, wealth can be created right. is incredible. Yeah. Like, it's, it's magic, right? He, he, he wrote The Wealth of Nations, and it was a question. How do nation, How did they get wealthy? Right. Because, like, proto-human, right, the, the human just dropped in a random spot is not wealthy at all. Right. And at some point through society, through this through this trade, it builds up. And, and he's directly responding to the economic philosophy of mercantilism, which right. does think in very zero-sum terms. Right. And again, it's broader than just monetary interactions. It's it's gaming interactions. It's oh, yeah. conversational interactions. Yeah. It's paying attention to the interests of the other person. It's emotional interactions. It's the whole thing. So you're taking a subset of this infinitely complicated stuff about adulting, and you pare it down to a rule book. Yeah. And everybody around the table learns a little bit more about adulting mm-hmm. around the game table with others. So everybody benefits. It's, yeah. it's a emotional wealth generating experience. Yeah, precisely. That's a great phrase. Or as my one of my economics professors would call it a psychic benefit. Yeah. <laughs> so again, that's kind of that's kind of my calling, and that's where yeah. I'm going. Uh, I make no secret of my uh, role as a disciple. I believe that uh, Jesus had a lot of good things going on, and then I want to make sure that I emulate those and all mm-hmm. my interactions. And we had a conversation. When I retired from the military, I said, okay, God, I'm going to do whatever you want now. And I sat every morning, I prayed, and listened. I said, what am I going to do? And about two weeks into it, I was sitting there and I said, okay, you know, I got a call, Calliope, about this game. And like, no, 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 I'm praying. And like, okay, and, and oh, yeah, now I got this prototype I got to work on. No, no. And I said, so, God, I'm sorry I'm distracted. He said, you're not distracted. You wanted me to tell you what to do. Go do it. It's how I built you. Yeah. And so this is my this is my mission field. Mm-hmm. Teaching people that you can play to grin and how wonderful that is, is what drives my life. That's and, fantastic. And, uh, and I'm having a blast doing it. And it has resulted from the time of that conversation. I have three games published. I have a fourth one coming out next summer. And I have three prototypes at uh, three other companies being considered. That's in, wonderful. In two and a half years. Yeah, and, and, and we're Christians also, so that's yeah. that's great to hear. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, especially since it's just so often I see in any form of art or creativity or something, right? If someone's going into it from a perspective of discipleship or, or you know, sharing sharing the truth, it often ends up being. I don't. How can we flavor this art with our brand of flavor rather mm-hmm. than? Well, right. it's about like <laughs> attaching a, a sermon on top of something right. rather than just pushing the value or, or, right. or exploring the values. Right? Well, right now, there are two competing forces in that are labeled Christianity. There's the, I'm going to tell you the right way to live so you don't perish. Right. Which is not God-given. It's me telling you how to live. It's, it's about transaction work. I'm in it to win, which is a zero-sum game. Mm-hmm. Okay. Or there's a, God thinks you're incredible. Therefore, I do too. What can I do for you today? Which is how Christ did it. Mm-hmm. And that wins. Gen Con this year, we had a Love Thy Nerd put on a panel on Christianity and gaming. We had 200 people show up. Oh, that's great. I've written yeah. for them a couple times. Yeah, they're hungry. There are people out there wanting to have those positive experiences. Yeah. And unfortunately, you're not going to find those in a lot of miniature <laughs> games where all the miniatures are, oh, you're not going to get that. Yeah, I know, I know growing up, one of the things that always bugged me growing up in the church is that there's, at least in my church, right, there was this this emphasis on 
fellowship. And I always ask, what does that even mean? Right? I need to go to this event in order to fellowship, but I don't enjoy it. I sit there in the corner. Fellowship is four words. Turn passes to you. <laughs> right. And, 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 and it's only after, I mean, the, in terms of human connection, having good conversations, growing deeper, closer to other people, growing closer to understanding and truth and, and all of that, has come about largely in the last few years as I've played games with friends. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. In, you, in you that, first, I've you understand give yourself not, yeah. a basis of trust and comfort where you're able to explore yeah. these versions. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't think our, our friendship really formed out of our great capacity to express ourselves emotionally. Uh, no. When I think about it, you know, it, those first years in Boston, yeah. it... It was through the medium of, of board games that, that really we, yeah, fellowship, I think, is, right. is, is, a, is a fine word to use for it. <laughs> right, and, it's, and it, it goes back to, I don't, I'm going to butcher this even paraphrase, but I know C.S. Lewis talked about the distinction I was mentioning, right? The distinction between going and being a scientist who is a Christian versus just being a Christian scientist who does science mm -hmm. great. Mm -hmm. Right and puts there's there's this and especially in movies it drives me nuts right the movies where there's this attempt to kind of get basic like baseline okay we got it looks professional in quotation in air quotes right and we're pushing this sermon right and and there's no thought given into the artistry of it or communicating anything other than super surface level stuff right and then to the, a lot of the world that's what Christian art is. And it's like, you know, Michelangelo was chiseling David. He was trying to make the greatest possible sculpture. It wasn't about shoving some kind of message down someone's throat. It's about expressing beauty and truth through he was, being excellent. He was loving God back through his sculpture. Yeah. And that's, that's how you do it. You love God back by loving people around you. That's the core. Again, Christ said, that's the core of all along. Love me back. And love everybody else back. Yeah. That's it. All the other rules, if you do that, all the other rules fall in place. Yeah. yeah. Getting back to gaming. Yeah. A second game is a collaboration with Chris Leader. Mm -hmm. It's called Imagineers by uh, Surf and Meeple, a company, a subsidiary called Maple Games. Uh, Daryl Andrews hosted. And it is a theme park building game. And you've got seven to ten rounds to build a theme park. And each turn, you can either build a ride that everybody rides. Or you can build part of your signature roller coaster. But the point is, if, if you ride your own ride, you get benefits as the owner, usually money back, and you get benefits of happiness and fame for the people who ride it. But it may be, if I put this where I know you're going to be moving, then you ride it, I get money, and you get the happiness. But that happiness might lead to fame for me that helped me win the game. So this constant balancing of there are choices that I just do myself that are probably the best strategy. I'm curious in, in your game. So a, a lot of the interactions you, you described, I think, can be m more or less community positive mm -hmm. based on the framing mm -hmm. of them. So so I'm curious, like, do you see the like the the theme park theme mm -hmm. really playing into? Giving the feeling of we're both benefiting. Yeah. Nobody goes around looking for a fight at a theme park. Right. Yeah. Everybody yeah. sees their friends say, hey, how you doing? That was great. What were you doing? Wow, where'd you get that ice cream cone? That looks good. It's all positive relationships. It's a positive milieu. Because nobody benefits from being nasty to everybody. So, yeah, the, the frame is part of it. But also, we deliberately baked into the scoring system that person who wins is a person who looks for opportunities to do things that are just not not just for me but for somebody else mm -hmm. and i was actually i was reading chris leader i always pronounce is a leader later leader. leader okay uh -huh. i was reading his designer diary on this and, and mm -hmm. from the account he'd been working on this for years and years and years kind of stuck it in a drawer and look right. at it every once in a while and then he said you came along and just kind of like breathed life into well, it I, I want to hear your I'm point of view on this godmother. <laughs> chris chris helped me make turn mansky caper from 12 cards and a bag of chips, okay, to the, the game that it is. And he taught me a lot about game design. And we had developed a very deep friendship. He's my best friend in the gaming industry and is an astounding human being. His job title at Calliope is Director of Fun, and he's <laughs> earned it. 
But Chris came to me two years ago at PAX, and he said, you know, I want to do a roller coaster game. I just, I just can't do it. Would you help me? And I said, oh, yeah, please. You know, that's like, uh, that's like uh, Clint Eastwood would say, would you like to have a bit part in my movie? Yeah, duh, yeah, okay. And, and he had tiles in his game. There was you know, a circle, and there were tiles that were roller coaster pieces, and there were tiles that were attractions like the little rides that are mm-hmm. scattered over the crown. And it just wasn't going. And so I said, let's make it two-sided. Each tile has a roller coaster piece on one side and an attraction on the other. And so every tile can do every action. And uh, and that was just looking at it from a different perspective. And from there, it all gl- it gelled into place, and we had a working prototype in six weeks. Oh, wow. Okay. Now, the, same, the next thing, Ravensburger was asking for people to design a uh, theme about the movies Back to the Future. Well, everybody who's been in the industry for a while knows that Chris Leader lives and breathes Back to the Future. He has four different working flux capacitors in his house. (laughs) And so he called myself and one of his old high school friends, Kevin Rogers, and you could hear his voice vibrating. He says, we have to be the ones to make this game. And he, again, had files of different incomplete attempts at a cooperative game for Back to the Future. And we sat down with him. And it just magic gelled in. We had a working prototype in six weeks, and we had a contract in three months. That's and, fantastic. And, uh, and that's, it, it that's will be, coming out soon. It will be out next summer. It is Back to the Future uh, Dice Through Town, the cooperative dice game. And it's going to be a simultaneous worldwide release next summer. Yeah, it seems you, you two kind of just, once you get together, it, 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 is it just a matter of being able to bounce ideas very quickly off of each other, or you both think differently? I think we think very differently, okay. but we both have the same joy that we approach gaming with. We're looking for maximizing the fun, and, and one of the tenets of, dice, of des- game design is to take everything that's not part of the fun and get rid of it. Mm-hmm. And so we're able to help each other see those parts that we may have an emotional attachment to, but that aren't helping the central part of the game. And I think that's what helps. We have a game that we're pitching right now, and it had a good pitch last night, but it wasn't there. It's about the 75, 80%. But then we sat back and we talked last night. We we'll both think about it. And now we both see a direction forward to modify the game and make it better. Very nice. One one question, kind of going back to the the broader topic of non zero sum games. We we touched on a bit before, but I'm I've been thinking recently more about again that almost limitation on in the fact that there is a single winner at the end of the game, mm-hmm. and you can build a game where I and mean, you could have a single winner, you could have a single loser, you can you can have a game with an adjustable amount, right? Mm-hmm. Everyone's trying to reach a certain goal by a certain time. Right. The people who do win, the people who don't, right. uh, don't win. Have you have you given consideration to different ways of getting a winner or even notions of what no. a winner is in yeah, a game? Yeah, I, I think object of the game is going to always be there. I think um, I lean more toward more cooperative games now because that's you want it, everybody to. But... If you're going to have an object of the game, because a lot of people don't like cooperative games, they want there to be a winner, but then you bake in the rest of the rule book how many fun experiences everybody can have so that it really doesn't matter who won. Mm -hmm. I've heard people say that after the Mansky game. Yeah, I didn't win, but so what? I had a great time. Those are the kind of games, to me, are the the perfect balance. I I know that's that's how I play also, right? I I very quickly forget who won or lost the game, but there's certain moments in games that I, uh, I'll remember right. years down the road, right. which uh, seems ideal. Yeah, right. and legacy games can, can also fill that, scratch that, because at the end of the time, you won't necessarily remember how many times you won, how many times you lost, but you all had this shared experience lasting over three to 12 months. Sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the 12. But when we finished Pandemic Legacy Season, season 2, we were exultant <laughs> because for the second half of the year, my wife Debbie, my God gift Debbie, had been telling us, no, we have to pay attention to this. It wasn't central to the mission for that month, but we have to pay attention to this. We have to pay attention to this. So, okay, Debbie. And when it came to the last mission, she had set up exactly the ideal way to win the first time. <laughs> because she had set up a, a way that it was in three turns we'd accomplish a mission and finished it and that, that was all because of the groundwork she laid <laughs> over the last four months and we all felt invested oh, yeah. delighted yeah this this is a, a little bit different but uh, I love the, the cooperative game feeling mm-hmm. this is 
an alternative to the to most of the games we've been talking about. I also love party games, and and uh, I'm curious what your experience with those are. Like, you know, the crypto has been a recent favorite, and even if you lose, maybe you got what the clue giver was saying that one time, and that's what you remember. The, I- was- yeah. the ideal party game is is let's play it again. Hive Mind is a great game for that because it's a trivia game for people who hate trivia games because there are infinite questions and no wrong answers. But you learn about each other as you play it. Because yeah. there's a card that says, name three flavors of ice cream. Okay? And everybody writes down three flavors. And then you say, okay, vanilla. Eight people raise their hand. Everybody who wrote down vanilla gets eight points. I write down butter brickle. I'm the only person who wrote down. I still got a point. It's a right answer. But I only got one point. And the low score gets shunned. So the idea is to maximize your score by thinking it like the other people. And Chris Leader gives a perfect example of when grandparents and grandkids get together. Somebody says, name three things you stand in line for. And Grandma says, Ellis Island, the DMV, and the bank. And the kids say, the cafeteria, the slide, and the, and the jungle gym. And they both learn about each other. And at the end of the game, their answers come toward each other. One I've just saw, seen at Gen Con, and I had to end up giving it away to somebody at Thanksgiving loved it so much, is just one. Just one. One person has to guess a word, and they don't know what the word is, but everybody else can see it. And they all have to write down a one-word clue without talking to each other. And I would say they all do. They reveal them. The person who's guessing doesn't get to see them yet. And any duplicates are eliminated. So if you have five people, and the word you want to get is pudding, and two people write tapioca, the guesser will not see those clues, either one. So you have to come up with words that are yeah, that's fascinating. obscure, yeah. but still get the word across. And so there's there's always this dynamic of you're being clever, but you're also thinking about what everyone else is exactly. thinking. Exactly. And that is, right now, the hot Let's Play Again game. Oh, yeah. I that's dare you to not want to play that three times a year. Yeah. Well, when the spiel. Yeah. yeah. In terms of your designs that you have coming up, is there... You said you had, what, three games at Publishers Now? Is there... Well, I've got, again, uh, I, I was given collaboration credit for the design of Surro Phoenix Rising. Okay. Which Calliope's game. I mean, an Imagineers, and then uh, Mansky Caper, and then next summer will be uh, Back to the Future Cooperative Dice Game. And I've got three or four more that you know, are at, in, in development. But the one that's not at a publisher right now is my, is my Holy Grail game, and uh, it's called The Candlelight Project. And the goal of Candlelight Project is to create the biggest network of positive relationships. Each person is a card and has connections, but it also has bridges, subjects that they love to talk about, friendly in a way, and triggers, subjects that tick them off. And you're playing cards to try to make sure if there's bridges there, positive relationships, put some candlelight on there. If you have one with a bridge and one with a trigger, and you can't make that right, you take candlelight off, or you maybe even separate those cards. And if they all both have chains of cards next to them, you may cause a rift in the entire community. And since all of you are playing on one tableau, that can cause, that can cut everybody's score in half. Mm-hmm. So the whole game of games, you're competing to be the best at creating positive relationships. Gee, you think I have an ulterior motive there? <laughs> <laughs> right. Because that, to me, is a game about enjoying the process of discipleship. And, and candlelight's the perfect metaphor, right? Mm-hmm. Because you know, you light a candle with another candle, it's only game. Right. You're not consuming one fire to create the other. So I'm hoping that you've had the first podcast describing a game that will someday be published. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. We'll look forward to it. Yeah, I know. That, that sounds wonderful. Your passion for this is obviously, it's off the charts. It's, well, it, I, it, it, I, my, I can my, see my, it. I can my see my it My Myers big personality type is extrovert. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> are, are there any particular experiences you've had playing or seen other people play any game that kind of exemplifies this philosophy of yours, this, this building community through yeah. gaming? Um, we have regular game nights at my house. And frankly, game nights kept me sane. In uh, 2010, my first wife, Terry, my true love, passed away from colon cancer. Mm. So one of the ways I was sane was we had have game nights every week at my house. Anybody in the community was available, open, and we have people who had never met each other that now are very close friendships because they met at game night. Some 82-year-olds and some 8-year-olds. Uh, and that, to me, is, exemplifies that kind of 
aspect. So it's kind of the meta game of seeing how many people you can get to enjoy each yeah. other around the game, game table. But in 2012, I met Debbie Franklin, no, Debbie Netto, and uh, we met at a church function. And she said, hey, you want to get go out eat, have some dinner? And I said, well, we're going to have game night, but I'll share a pizza with you before. And she came to game night, and there were 20 people there, and we sat down. We brought out Kingsburg, and she said, oh, I've never played games like that before, but I'll give it a try. And she won by eight. <laughs> so I said, there's something there. And we've been married six years now. That's she, wonderful. She's my, I call her my God gift. That's wonderful. So I won. <laughs> In terms of the gaming community, what you've seen, because like that kind of, of game night and that kind of experience is, is amazing. But I mean, most of what I see in the broader gaming community is filtered through what I see on social media, on the internet. Mm-hmm. And oftentimes that can look so bleak and so divisive and so torn apart. Is your outlook kind of overall for the board gaming hobby optimistic? Oh, or is it so. it's still optimistic for, despite those kinds of things I'm sure you've seen also? First of all, we're a globe, okay? We are, we are lots of different kinds of people. You have to remember that social media is all designed, to, and uh, Science Mike puts this extremely well, there are algorithms designed to create a splinter group. If you, if you look at posts of bleakness, the computer will feed you more bleakness. If you look at posts of positivity, you will get more posts of positivity. So I make a point of hiding or snoozing sources of bleakness. I make a point of liking sources of positivity. And if there's a chance to inject positivity into a thread of bleakness, I do so. And by doing that, I'm gaming the system to help the bleak sections see some positivity and maybe warm up encourage and support those people who are already positive and not let myself be beaten down by a false narrative, a false narrative that everything sucks. Ten years ago, studies showed that 90% or more of the gaming community was atheist or agnostic. That number is closer to 65% now. But you're never going to see that on Twitter. But it's reality. The way to increase love in the world is to love, not to battle. You just go have fun, play to grin, and you will make more play to grin. I can do that. You can do that. So let's just go do it and let it work. One of the ways the world makes us feel inadequate and and hopeless is to help us think that it's only us. But it's not only us. 2,000 years ago, the guy said, I'm going to send my spirit to you, and I'm going to make everything you do work. Let it work. Give him the credit and keep doing it. And it's a ride. It's a wonderful ride. And then finally, what would you say to people who would argue that trying to change the world, improve the world, spread a message, spread love mm-hmm. through gaming is ultimately frivolous or small, right? It, it's just a game, that kind of thing. I can only examine my life, okay? Nine years ago, I was alone, widowed, and hopeless. I now have you and a thousand people in that uh, auditorium below us at Pax Unplugged that I know personally, none of which I knew in 2010. I'm the proof that that's a fallacy, that everything is frivolous. And that, and that goes back right to the, to the idea of fellowship, right? I didn't understand it at first. Why did, what did my parents mean? Like, why did I have to go to these functions? And it, and it wasn't, fellowship isn't like a church function you go to. It's, it's how you live your life in this perspective. Because I can tell, like, you and I are very different. You're capital E, extroverted, I'm not. Right. Right? But we can still sit at a table, play a game, have good discussions, think, express our creativity. Yeah. Uh, Again, in terms of the non-serialism game, okay, I have been enriched, blessed, astounded by all these new friends I have. And they come up to me and say, I'm enjoying myself better because we both won. And if you multiply that times a thousand, that's a million new relationships. I feel like we should be playing the council room in Dominion. Everybody wins. <laughs> <laughs> tradition of shouting. I, I couldn't agree more. I, I think perspective on this is, is wonderful. Love the positivity. And, and, and none of it is me. Okay? Mm-hmm. This is not the Ken Franklin show. This is living the life the way it's supposed to be lived. Yeah, absolutely. 
Well, thank you so much for being on the podcast. I am I'm once again blessed and honored that you that you asked me to be on, and I'm really thankful that we had this conversation. And if people want to get in touch with you, you are. I know you're on Twitter. I'm on Twitter as um, Ken Plays to Grin, with a number two for the words. Ken Plays the number two Grin. I'm on Facebook, of course, as Ken Franklin. Uh, I'm on Instagram as Dr. Ken F P D R K E N F P is in family practice, mm-hmm. my specialty, and. and you can usually get a hold of me through Calliope Games or uh, Surf and Meeple Games. Great. Thanks again. Uh, thank you, everyone, for listening to The Thoughtful Gamer. Don't forget to check out thethoughtfulgamer.com. Go ahead and rate and review this podcast on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. If you'd like to support the show, go to patreon.com slash thethoughtfulgamer. Thanks for listening. Goodbye.